Hello. Okay. All right. Hi. Okay. Yeah. This is, yeah. Okay. Just pressed into grandfather duty here at the, at the last minute. It's okay. His mom is going to sing. Mom and dad is going to, this is Luke. He's seven months and he's grandchild number seven for me. So just so you know. All right. So we have a couple things to tell you about. Welcome to church. If you're watching online, great. Like I said the other night, my name is Steve. This is my church. We're so happy that you're with us. Would you stand, please? I want to show you one thing. It's this card. It's a save the date card. So it's got a lot of significant things that are happening uh, from now until the end of the year, 2019. So you can keep that on your refrigerator. Uh, the big thing coming up will be the uh, marriage getaway. Uh, the rates for that go up on Friday. So if you haven't registered for the marriage getaway, uh, please uh, do that, and uh, we need to know how many people are coming to that. That'll be a great time. Uh, that'll be a great time down on uh, down on the waterfront, right? Right. It's going to be a good time, right, Luke? Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's pray. You want to pray, Luke? Uh, no. Okay. Lord, we thank you for uh, bringing us together this morning. We thank you for your grace and this great week that we've had with uh, with uh, Pastor Ben and his travels today, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for your, your blessing on our church and the church worldwide, that you would do a, a great work in every church where the Spirit is moving and the Bible is open. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
there is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is a light that overwhelms the darkness. There is a that forever reigns. There is freedom from the chains that bind us. Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the waters, who speaks to the sea, who stands
Father in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. You've been given a name above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thank you, God. Jesus. Let's just say his name, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's no greater name that we can say, no greater word that we can utter. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you that we can speak your name, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You've overcome, Jesus. You have overcome, Jesus. our service, God. Speak to us in this service. Anoint our ears to listen that we would receive from you. We would humble ourselves in your presence, God. Thank you, Lord. We're so thankful for all that you've done, God. So thankful that you continue to speak to us, to minister to us. Thank you, God. What is man that you are mindful of him? Thank you, God. That you continue to call us your friends, God, your sons, your adopted ones, your heirs. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Just bless our service. Speak to us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Steve and Nancy, great to see you. And we have Pastor Lewis here from Saugus. It's great. He drove down to be with us for the weekend. Uh, the, and then Pastor Ben, this is his last, last uh, day. He flies out tonight to Israel to go back and uh, we had just had a great week as God used him to minister to us. It was so fresh and, and spiritually uh, encouraging. And for me, as he's a very dear friend to so many of us and I didn't do a lot of preaching. <laughs> wow, that was great. To be sitting with you, with you folks, you know, down there, and just be all week listening and being fed and encouraged. Oh, it was so, such a treat. I was blessed. I was so blessed by it. Um, on our sermon card, this is our last Sunday on the card, and maybe you don't know that we are following this, but this is the the last one, friends, friends in heart. This is our theme for today, friends. And I can't help but feel that with Pastor Ben here, has a very good friend, and Pastor Lewis. Uh, you know, Pastor Lewis was a six hour drive or something, or seven or five or six and a half, you know, to get in his car you know, up in Boston, and come down and just be with us for a couple of days. Uh, that means a lot. And, and he's doing it before God and us and blesses us. It, it's, a, it's a blessing. It's a big thing. So I appreciate it. And then um, through the week, because Pastor Ben and I go back more than 40 years We've been together, and we have been together in the spirit, though living in separate countries. We have years together where we were bond, bonded in the Lord, in our work, in our heart, in our mind, in our way. Uh, Pastor Chuck Heidenreich is sitting here, Sue is here, and they know this in Africa and in their lives as we all learn this in the Lord, you know, what is a friend? 
Ah, good question, isn't it? An important one, like what is a friend? A spiritual friend, you know? Okay, so that'll be our subject this morning, and, and it, it'll be rich. Pastor Ben is going to share with us. Um, uh, before we move on, um, I'd like to give a shout out to Pastor Ray and his homeless ministry. Um, it, there's a photo that you sent me last night. I didn't get it, you know, to go up on the screen. Maybe later today we'll show. But he had on the street. How did it work, Pastor Ray? Chatter on Facebook now about getting off the drugs. So something's happening. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Wow. Is that so the the picture you're in a parking lot in front of the library, seventy two people and and one one of the homeless people that, that died is being respected. Uh, and and then you preach there. And and one gets saved, and then there's the chatter about getting off of drugs, and hook up with Pastor Ray. Pastor Ray, I met a a person up, you know, asking for money on the street up there at Golden Ring, and uh, he said, "Do you know Pastor Ray?" <laughs> I go, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> yeah, do you know Pastor Ray? You know, so. The Midnight Express is the van and the project, which really came from Rachel uh, Corsi years ago. I mean, it came from you, of course. I mean, you're, you're the guy, but actually we were knocking on doors and we, we knocked on Rachel's door. This was years ago, five years ago. And she said, you know, the church should have a van with toothpaste and toothbrushes and underwear and towels and 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 stuff and go out in the night the at midnight and reach people and hand out sandwiches and stuff so that was in our mind you know and and then you come into the church and you do it and so we we said you know just the midnight express and and uh Good things happen through your work and the team with you, and there's a lot of 25 people in the church that do it. Uh, okay, this is the offering. Okay, let's just try it. Pastor Chuck is supposed to do it, but I'm doing it, I guess. Okay, so um, here it is. In the United States of America, Churches do not receive federal money. Can I hear amen? amen? You know, hallelujah. We don't want your money. We got money. We got money in our pockets. It's our church. It's not your church. It's our church. It's God's church. This church doesn't belong to the government in that way. This church belongs to God, and we don't need your money. We got our money. God gave me money and put it in my pocket, and I'm going to take some of my money, and I'm going to put it in the offering. And you know what good things happen with our, our love and our faith? Homeless guys, we give money to the abortion, the, um, this... Uh, saving babies up the Bel Air Road. A small amount of money every year. We give to some rehab uh, ministry where we used to, I'm not sure if we do, I'm not sure if they're still running the Nehemiah house. We have, we, we have our money for our stuff. 
We educate our kids. We send out our missionaries. We pay our bills. We hire our pastors and our workers. And we're very thankful for that. And you can just kind of lean over to your neighbor and pat him on the back and say, you're doing a good job at it. God bless you. Keep it up. Go ahead. Just say, come on, give. Give in the offering. And also, why don't you lean over and tap him on the shoulder and say, give double. <laughs> come on, pick it up. All right, give double. <laughs> okay? Pastor Chuck, God bless you. I mean, I just took your time. <laughs> would you pray with me right now? He's fine. I talked to him before. I thought this would happen, so I told him ahead of time. You don't worry about his feelings. He's rock solid. <laughs> He's fine. <clears throat> okay. Father, pour your financial blessings on our people. Help them in these great days we are living. These are the end times. And we, we more than ever see the strength of America coming from the people, from in our hearts, from spiritual people, God's people, people with love and serving down in the gutters and the, on the streets and where people live. Help us. We, we want babies to be born, not aborted. We want our homeless people to find a new life. We want university kids to find Christ. We want the immigrants to come into this country to find a spiritual community. We are here for this. Bless our work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Your voice made the stars ignite i 
top of my lungs because you were verses from God because I woke up at 1.30 in the morning and I don't wake up at 1.30 in the morning <clears throat> so and God said this verse to my heart so uh, Ephesians chapter 4 just the beginning part of it verse 4 says there is one body that was it so don't read anymore there is one body. Just think about that for a little bit, and that's, that's what I started doing. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, this is one body. In Baltimore, we have our church in Peabody. Say the body there, the body in Baltimore, the body in Marlboro. And there is local expressions, but we're one body. We're one body, and, and um, in the one body principle, there is uh, neither rich nor poor, even though there might be. Uh, different uh, personalities, but in the one body, in Christ, we are one, and if we see just Jesus Christ, like somebody asked me a little while ago, they said, uh, somebody... Uh, got into some trouble, and they said, you should have known this person would do this. You should have known that he was always like that. I said, I only know him as a Christian. I don't know what he was like before. I only know him after Christ. Like the song we just sang, There Is No Other Name, uh, but like I have that name, and you have that name. We are called Christians after Christ, and we have Christ between us. And the devil uh, loves to, like he gave me a million reasons not to come down here, a million. You know, my, my wife is homesick right now, and said, so maybe you should stay home. 
take care of your wife. Uh, people are sick everywhere. Things are going on with people. The Patriots are in the Super Bowl. <laughs> so you can't go to Baltimore, a Patriots fan. The Ravens fan will find out. Oh, maybe I should wait till after the Super Bowl. <laughs> but no. I just didn't wear any Patriots clothes down here. That's all. No. But the devil loves to give up, make us feel like strangers in the body. There is, there is just one body. But isn't it amazing how the devil comes at us and tries to make us feel strange in that one body? Just because a part of it is 400 miles away. Or maybe it's right next door. Like, I don't know if God laughs or he weeps when he sees churches lined up on a corner, like you can see a city block and there's six churches, and none of them talk to each other. But there's one body. Uh, so if they're believers in Christ, they're one body. And it's, it's amazing to me sometimes that we just let these little differences get in the way. But if they are believers, then they're in the same body. We're one body, one. And we are one because of Christ. We have that name, Christian. Um, did you ever try to save a saved person? I saw that happen a few weeks ago. We're out in, out in the streets and, and uh, talk to this person. The person says, oh, I'm, I'm saved. And they said, the person said, really? Are you sure? It's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm saved. That's all they had to hear was pretty sure. It was like, if you don't go to my church, I don't know if you're saved, even though if you say you're saved. But if you say you're saved, then you're saved. Uh, if you know you're a believer, you're a believer. You know, we are, there is one body. And it doesn't matter uh, what church they're going to. If they're saved, they're one body. We have Christ between us. It doesn't matter. Um, it's like uh, when I walked in, um, one of the first person I saw when I walked in was Pastor Ben. And someone said, Pastor Ben, do you know Pastor Lewis? And he goes, I've seen him around. You know, like, I've been in the ministry 40 years, 40 years, but we've never really talked uh, because of this or that. But we instantly had a bond because we're one body. And it doesn't matter where he lives, what he has done, what I have done, but we have Christ, we're one body. We have that between us and is instant fellowship. And if you let that and only that stay between you, you won't feel strange. But the devil loves to make you feel strange in the body. Why? So that you won't come anymore. So that you'll back away. And then when you do come, you say, where you been? It's like, I feel strange. And then there's two people sitting right next to each other and they both feel strange. And, but you're one body. You have Jesus Christ, and that's all we need to fellowship with one another. It's all we, we have. I, my flesh doesn't want to fellowship with a, a believer. My, uh, my flesh has no place here. It shouldn't have any place here. It's crucified with Christ. There is only Jesus Christ between us, that one body, no matter where we are in this world. If we are believers in Christ, we have that one body. Friends at heart, I think Pastor Shala said. In our hearts, we are one because of Jesus Christ. It is an amazing thing to think about that you can go, like, uh, I'll close with this. Um, you know the expression, uh, where's the love? You always hear that up north. I don't know if you hear it down here, but where's the love? You know, and like, you never have to hear that here. Where's the love? Because it's always here. And that is a great tribute to this body and the worldwide body of Christ because that's how they know we're his disciples, by the way. We love one another, right? Amen? Amen. Thank you. <clears throat>
I could have honestly listened to longer to this. This was so healthy, so good. When I'm here now, I kind of have like all the things already in a suitcase, so my mind is here, but my heart is also getting ready to move to the next step. But let me just say this, uh, this topic of friendship, friendship with God, friendship with people, friendship is so deep. It's so deep. It's not just having two bodies next to each other, but two hearts needed with a common purpose. And if the cross is there and life, that's very, very deep. Thank you, Lord, for divine friendships. Thank you for making your friendship available to us. When the Lord said, let us make man in our image, he didn't say, let us make man, I will make man in my image. He could have spoken in singular, but he also is unity. So he's, he said, let us make man in our image. So there's the Lord, the word of the Lord, who is now known by the name of the Messiah. And there's the spirit of the Lord. Let us make man in our image. As we have fellowship, as we are one, as God is one, is another way of saying God is love. Let us make man that in his small circles and in his small areas and where he is, in his own sandbox, which is a time-space box, that he can begin to tap into this. And God meant it to be. His purpose was not that man would sin and sin would come and tear this possibility away. Sin came in. But then there is, a, there is a higher way where sin abounded. Grace did much more abound. So that we could have his friendship in our relationships. There are some scriptures that are just awesome and examples of these friendships in the Bible. But I'm going to turn to a scripture which is unique in by the will of God in James 2, 23. While we're turning there, having lived in Jerusalem and having been in the very corner of the old city where all the earth comes, I met so many people and many unique people, special people. And I was always conscious of trying to see who comes, who is lonely, who has the Lord brought there, and if I'm supposed to talk to someone. So one day, a little bit older gentleman than myself came in. He had a color like a priest. He looked like he's a little bit lonely, but he looked very, very rich on the inside. And he looked around, everybody was busy picking up postcards, and he felt like, I'm here alone, but I'd love to talk to someone. I turned my head and I said, sir, I think you have a story. That's all I said. He said, yes, I have a story. I was sitting in a, here in a coffee house, but people were just talking and I didn't want to interfere and push my story. But since you asked, I'll tell you my story. He was in, he was in, he came just out of South America. He was, and he died. He literally died. What happened is he was already in a casket. He was already in a casket, in a, not casket, but in a cold room, you know, where they have seat over your head. And this is what he said. Uh, this is not the Bible. We'll go to the Bible soon. But this is what he said. He said, I was up there. I thought my work was done. 
I thought my work was done. And then the Savior, the Messiah, came to me and said, you need to go back one more time. There's a few more people you need to tell the story. And he said, I sent you back. And he pulled down the sheet, and the person working next to him <laughs> almost had a heart attack. <laughs> they almost had to change places. <laughs> But this is about Brother Run. He was 17 years old when someone asked him to go to a spiritual meeting in New Mexico. Until then, nobody had said to him, I love you. He was crippled. He was born crippled. And people thought that he was cursed. And I, and, you, and I can't even repeat some of the things that they said to him and told him. They, they thought he was cursed. So somebody said to him, would you like to come to a spiritual meeting? What is a spiritual meeting? There was one of those men that had a gift to pray, especially by faithful sick people. And he uh, said, I might as well go. Now, this is his story. It's not the Bible, but it's very interesting. So he went to the Christian meeting. He sat in a pretty much front row. And next to him was somebody that said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me my sins. So he thought everybody is supposed to say these words. He didn't know what they even meant. He said, Jesus, please come into my heart and forgive my sins. And literally he had an experience that he was with Jesus. I can't explain it, he can't explain it, but he just was with Jesus. And Yeshua, the Messiah, said to him, I love you. He was shocked. Nobody has ever sent these words to me. And then the Lord said, and I heal you. He opens his eyes like, what was this experience? I'm sitting in this chair and I'm completely well. And he goes home, and his father sends him to mental hospital. Amazing. Love can be so misunderstood that if somebody operates in love, people think this person is crazy. Friendship. I was a friend with Richard Wurbrandt. Pastor Seller knew him. Once we traveled in a car with him. He spoke in a big church. After the church meeting, he walked out, and on the steps was a drunk, drunkard, drunken man, I should say. He sat down next to him, and the people were saying, Come, come, Richard, the food is waiting, the meal is waiting, the guests are waiting. He looked with sad eyes and he said, my friend, you don't understand. This, you and I, we have many friends. This man has no friends. He sat with him, listened to him, and then shared with him. And it took three hours and the food got very cold, <laughs> but his heart was very warm. There's an amazing scripture in the book of James, Jacob, as we say, chapter 2. And Abraham is called three times a friend of God. Well, we're talking about friendship. Why do we talk about being friend with God? Because I cannot really be someone's friend unless I'm a friend of God, unless I see that he translates his friendship, the father and son's friendship and that spirit to my friendships, there can be agreement in the mind, but it's not fire of love in the spirit. Two cannot walk together very long unless they agree, but this agreement can be so deep uh, by the way, my wife is my best prayer partner and will be married 
in, in March by the will of God, 40 years. No, some of you have been longer. Pastor Sellers beaten me many times over. Okay, James, <laughs> James, James Jacob, chapter 2 and verse 23, or 22 and 23. Here's a unique verse, and when you, like, go over it quickly, you may miss the point the way I missed it. Seest thou how faith works wrought with his works, and by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed in God, and he was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called a friend of God, the friend of God. Now here's a point. This scripture which says that Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him for righteousness was fulfilled. I thought a prophecy is fulfilled. But how is it fulfilled that he believed in God and he was justified or saved? How does that need to be fulfilled? That's already a complete statement. Here is the thing. Justification is not for justification alone, but it's for a friendship of God. Abraham believed in God, and he counted it for him for righteousness. He saw him as a justified man, and then also, he doesn't tell how it came about, but he was called the friend of God, and he showed it in action. But being justified is for the purpose of being friend of God. Justification is not for justification. Justification is for being friend of God and being friend for one another. And here's the thing. God meant this amazing, amazing purpose this amazing, amazing life that he is experiencing there. Uh, the my Israel, all that, that hero Israel, that passage is all about that. But he meant that to be translated into our world. Sin came in. Sin came in. Sin broke everything. But being justified by his grace is the key. Being justified is the key for the floodgates of life of that resurrection. Resurrection life, by the way, is simply that life of the Father and the Son, that fellowship. Like it says in the book of Romans, that our Lord, as, after he justified us by his death, or he died for the justifying death, the glory, he was raised up from the dead by the glory of of the Father, not just by the glory of God, but glory of the Father who said, you are my son, this day I have begun you. And in God's eyes, we rose from the dead. So if in God's eyes we are justified, when that translates to friendships, I am to see everybody in 2 Corinthians 5, 16 way. We don't know any man after the flesh, and we do not know any man after the human body. We do not know any man after their human abilities. We know them like we enter into the holy place. All the boards are covered with gold. And that's something I cannot do by myself. I cannot go behind the eyes of God and just see everybody how God sees them. But you know what I can do? I can tap into that source and say one more time, one more time, here in his love, not that we loved God. Even the love, its core, its center, its residence, is not how we live by him. We're supposed to live by him. We have that experience. We have that living walk with him where it just happens. Life happens. 
as we walk in the grace message. But then, hearing his love, the center of it is, in, is not in this, how we love God, even though we experience that love, giving back to him. But even the love is not there, how we feel it. I can't deny that there's a lot of feeling at times in it. It, it. Nothing is based on that feeling, but there's a sense of life. There's a sense of newness. There's a sense of that good morning, like they say in uh, people that died and came back, that pa Baptist pastor had a beautiful, um, they write books. They say that people, after they reach the other side, just in terms of illustration, they say that they have a habit of saying, good morning, even long time after having been there in, in, in those glorious places. Because nothing is anticlimactic. Nothing is anticlimactic. It's like the next moment is better, 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 more of grace, more of life, more of love, more of glory. However, in little bits and pieces, we experience it here. In little bits and pieces, we taste it. But the core of love is not even in that. If it were in that, we would be comparing. Friendship could be competition friendships. Oh, my goodness. Competition kills friendships. I, I listened to the story of uh, one of the best 10-kilometer uh, uh, runners, uh, and his pal was from the same country, and they competed often, and, and one of them always got the gold. But you know what uh, this man, his name was Ritola. What Ritola, some of you remember Ritola, what he said about his pal Nurmi, he said, he said, we only met each others at the track. Before that, after that, we never talked. And he kind of said, like, I wanted to talk, like, sort of wanted to talk to that pal. But no, it was all about who is the best. Friendships are not about who is the best, because we only tap into the source. Here is love, not that we loved God, not even how we experienced him, but that he first loved us and laid down his life for us. And the more we tap into that, the more, the more friendships are easy. One has a good sense of humor, another is very diligent. There's various different kinds of people, and God expands our hearts in friendships. But our friendships are a way to tap deeper into the love of God. And then God, God's love, on the other hand, inspires us for deeper friendships. So James is wondering why we are not going back to his book here. Let's go back to it. Okay? Uh, Abraham believed in God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So being justified it's a gateway to being a friend of God. But seeing others, my friends, as justified, that helps me to see them first in the friendship of God. And when I, when I concentrate on that love, I'm kind of like getting out of myself and just saying, Lord, my friend, he may be a nice guy, he may not be perfect in everything. I'm even less than him. <laughs> but what is God after? How is God drawing him into deeper friendship with God? These are amazing things. And maybe in closing, one more point, one more thought here. Uh, often friendships come about in a strange way. And the second thing is you have certain friendships, you try to cultivate them and you try to build them and not really much come out of them. But then we all have those and it's sweet and it's good, but they don't get really deep. But then you got some other friendships 
that even though you don't have so much time, but there's regularity to them, it may be just from convention to convention or meeting once a month or I don't know, but it is so deep because it is from heaven. And they're God-given. And often God-given friendships come in strange ways. Example, a couple of years ago we went to the conference in Budapest. Now I have to learn to say Poland instead of Budapest. My mind is working on Budapest tracks still. And we went to Budapest. My wife got very sick from the start. Oh no. She said, did I come to Budapest just to puke? Was that the purpose of it? Make a, take a plane trip and puke a few days and go back. Well, let me say one thing. That's a very interesting thing. I got to go still to many of these services, but I made sure she was okay. And the time when I wasn't in the services, I was with her praying for the services, enjoying the presence of God. And oh, the friends kept coming off the hours and usually usually outside of the meeting times. Yeah. Uh, and uh, they kept coming and rolling in the afternoon. The room was filled with people. We shared stories. There was like a little bit of church life right in that hotel room. And the hotel servants were wondering what's going on in that room. And there was one very, very special person, Kim, that came in. And Kim shared her story, how she was healed out of a particular sickness here in one of these healing meetings, awesome story. We shared, we shared stories. And the truth is, if, if that did not happen, some of the friendships that would not have happened. Sue was there, many other people were there. I would have never come to know Kim, and Ramona says the same thing, the way we did, unless, was, unless it was in that place. So let me say this, when our plans don't work out, there may be another purpose to make another friendship. And then when we are on journeying on from country to country, in the airplane, sometime in the airport, it happens. We meet somebody just has to hear about that friendship of God. That happened to me on way down. Now probably I'll sleep the whole way through. But let me say, let me really close by saying. What that man called Brother Ron, that pastor, whose whole ministry was going around the world, loving little children. R Brother Ron, when he came to Jerusalem again and again, he always said to me, thank you for friendship. Thank you for being kind. I didn't think like anything of being kind, but he said, thank you for being kind. Because in other words, that is the culture of heaven. And Pastor Scheller was kind to me when I was in a burnout 42 or so years ago. Literally, I, I was uh, just frozen, really frozen. And his kindness by God gave me another chance to get out and Yes, to get out and keep going. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness to us. The kindness of God appeared to us. Paul says uh, in his epistles, after that, the kindness of God appears. Thank you for that kindness in your works of salvation that we can have eternal friendship with you and one with another. Thank you, church, here for being friends. Amen. Thank you. That was so good. Thank you. Wow, that's so edifying. Hey, he uses my name. That's amazing. It's so edifying. You know, to hear that in the course of the message and the love and the kindness and the spirit using him. So we're going to be praying for him 
as he goes back to Israel and and, uh, and his work there and his travels and so on. And he means a lot to us. Uh, as we close, we could um, do an altar call, give an opportunity for people who are listening on the internet or here in the auditorium to make a decision to believe in Christ. I, why do I believe in Christ? Why would I do that? Why do I need Christ? The answer is, I am not a friend of God. To be honest, in Romans chapter 8, I'm an enemy of God. Um, I hide from him. I'm afraid of him. He's the, the big unknown. I'm, I'm wor- I don't really want to be involved. I, I think it's better and safer to stay away from God and this message and these people and this Bible. I might have a Bible, but I never read it. I might believe that there are believers, but I'd rather not. I I'd, I'd never really, I don't know who they really are. Uh, I may believe in God, but I just want to call him the guy upstairs or the force or some, you know, later, later, later. I'll look at that later, later. Uh, I don't know what tomorrow will bring. The proverb says, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I may die today. I don't know. Don't put it off. Don't don't wait. It's the great gift of God. You and I are in trouble without Christ. We are lost, and we don't know God. And so today, Ask, believe. Really, we don't need to ask. It says, receive him. And the, most of the verses say, believe in him. Believe in him. Not because of any, well, for whatever reason, believe in him, but primarily because he is saying, we are wrong. We are in trouble. We are dying. We are sinners. We are We are avoiding him. We are not looking. We are not seeking. We are not finding. We don't know him. But God came into our world on the cross, arms stretched out, hands open to say, I love you. I'm vulnerable. I die. I die. I take your sin on me because I love you. So believe in him today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, I decide to come to you and believe in you. And I ask you to justify me so I could be your friend. You would tell me secrets You would be my Father in heaven. You would never fail or forsake me. Jesus, I believe in you. Save me by your grace in Christ's name. Amen. Wow, great. Good. Hey, good subject. Friend of God, hey, I got one la- one thing. Would you stand with me? We'll sing together be- before we go. If you have a special prayer request and you want to come down and get a prayer down here, down front, we are here, the pastors, we can go stand down there and we receive you and pray for you. Um, okay, we'll share it later. Okay, folks, come on.
Oh, 